This lesson is about making salts. Before you start, I'd like you to see what you can remember from our last few lessons by answering these questions. So if you'd like to pause the video now. OK, so what iron makes a solution alkali? It's an OH minus iron, or you might have written hydroxide iron, which is the name of the OH minus iron. Write the equation for the reaction between hydrogen and hydroxide ions in a neutralisation reaction. So hopefully you had H plus plus OH minus produces H2O. And you'll notice the state symbols, the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion have got this, the AQ state symbol because they are aqueous, they're dissolved in water. Write the general equation for the reaction between an acid and an alkali. Acid plus alkali produces salt plus water. What salt would be formed from the reaction between sodium hydroxide and nitric acid? Well, when you are predicting what salt is formed, you need to look to the alkali and take the name of the metal in the alkali, which is sodium in this case. And then the ending of the salt name comes from the acid and nitric acid make nitrate salts. The salt is sodium nitrate. This lesson is about making salts. You're going to be able to state three ways to make a soluble salt. And if you remember from C2, soluble means that it can dissolve in water. Um, then go on to predict the products of a reaction, of reactions that produce a salt. And finally, as the top skill, construct a method to make pure dry samples of insoluble salts. So insoluble is when a salt or when anything, a substance will not dissolve in water. So just to remind you of an important keyword, which we looked at last lesson, neutralisation. That is a reaction that takes place when an acid and base react. So here in the diagram, I've got an acid and a base reacting and they are um, producing the products, which will be salt and water. So salts are produced in neutralisation reactions and it's from a French word meaning to counterbalance. You want to think about it, the acid is neutralised. A few lessons ago, we met this general neutralisation reaction. An acid plus an alkali produces a salt plus water. Just to make sure you can remember how to apply that general equation, I'd like you to complete these word equations. So if you'd like to pause the video now. OK, so I know that an acid plus an alkali will produce a salt plus water. So my products are salt plus water, but I need to work out the name of the salt. The first part of the salt's name comes from the metal in the alkali and the second part comes from the acid and sulfuric acid makes sulfates. So I have potassium sulfate plus water. So then for nitric acid plus lithium, my salt will be lithium nitrate. So I have lithium nitrate plus water. And finally, hydrochloric acid plus calcium hydroxide. So calcium chloride is my salt and so it's calcium chloride plus water. Just take a minute to make sure that you can remember that sulfuric acid will produce sulfates, nitric acid will produce nitrates and hydrochloric acid will produce chlorides. Another form of the same equation is an acid plus a base produces salt plus water. If you remember that an alkali is a soluble base. All but uh, many bases are insoluble, but the bases that are soluble are called alkalis. So it's the same, a different form of the same equation. So an example would be sulfuric acid plus copper oxide produces copper sulfate plus water. And here copper oxide is the base, so it's insoluble, so it's a base, but it's not an alkali. Now, this is an experiment that we looked at in C1. And you will have either seen or um, carried out yourself. So we have sulfuric acid, which is this colourless, clear liquid uh, solution. Copper oxide is a black powder and it produces copper sulphate, which are these lovely blue coloured crystals and water. 
And I've included this symbol equation uh, below for you. Make sure that you do remember the, the uh, chemical formulae for your acids. So H2SO4 is sulfuric acid. I've not concentrated very heavily on the, chemi on the symbol equations in this lesson. And the reason is next lesson, we'll be constructing the symbol equations and learning how to um, put together the chemical formula for the salts. The reaction between copper oxide and sulfuric acid is a required practical and it is mentioned it is in C4 on your specification but I will have introduced it in C1 and I do this because it's a good example of filtration and crystallisation. So first of all you can see here that we have a beaker that's half filled with just boiled water and in the beaker, there's a boiling tube which contains 15 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid. That will be left there for a couple of minutes. This is to increase the temperature of the sulfuric acid, because if we increase the temperature, um, we'll increase the rate of any reaction that's going to occur. At school, if I demonstrated this, I will, have heat, I will probably have heated the sulfuric acid gently using a Bunsen burner. Then 1.82 grams of copper oxide is measured, is measured out and that is added to the sulfuric acid. What I will have done is I will have added a, a spatula of copper oxide to the sulfuric acid and given it a swirl and then added another spatula of copper oxide and, and given that a swirl and I will have kept doing that until the copper oxide no longer disappeared so it stopped reacting and I had an excess. So I now have a, a solution which is copper sulfate and water, the products of my reaction, but also contains the excess copper oxide, which is a black insoluble solid. So in order to remove the copper oxide, I'm going to use filtration. So I've got a funnel and filter paper set up here. And if we filter that solution, the copper oxide will get stuck in the filter paper. That is our residue. And the filtrate running through is our copper sulfate solution and we can collect that in the conical flask. At school, what I will have done is I will have poured the solution into a an evaporating dish and heated it gently until crystals began to form. Then I will have allowed it to cool down and will have put it on the side in the lab and left it for a couple of days. And then we'll get these, the, the water will evaporate and we'll be left with these blue crystals. And to make sure that's completely dry, we can then put the crystals onto filter paper, which will absorb any excess water. I just wanted to show you this. This is a picture of an art um, exhibition, which is currently at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. I think it's called Seizure. But an artist took a, a flat, um, a derelict flat, and filled it with copper sulfate solution and had a setup so they could heat it for a number of hours every day and then allow it to cool down. And they did that for a number of weeks and then drained it. And what you have is this flat, which is a, a main room and a bathroom. And it's wall to wall with copper sulfate crystals. It's quite fantastic and it's well worth going to see. That's up at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park at the moment in Wakefield. So salts are compounds that are formed when the hydrogen in an acid is replaced wholly or partly by a metal. It's from an old English word meaning briny, because you may know that brine is salt water. Um, and in a chemistry sense, that was first introduced in 1790, relating to experienced sailors, and it was due to relating to the saltiness of the sea. So salts are ionic compounds, and there's a picture there of some, some salts. So if I think about acid plus base produces salt plus water, if I think that's my first method for producing a salt, I'm going to show you a second method. When a, a reaction takes place between a metal and an acid, a salt is formed. And there is another general equation which you also need to learn. Metal plus acid produces salt plus hydrogen. And the example could be iron plus hydrochloric acid produces iron chloride plus hydrogen. The symbol equation is here below for you. So you see I've got the symbols here and the chemical formula for hydrochloric acid. What's happening is the metal is replacing the 
hydrogen in the acid. So it's, it's displacing it, it's pushing it out. So it's going to need to be more reactive than the hydrogen. So just to remind you, the salt is formed when the hydrogen is replaced by the metal. We looked at naming salts last lesson and earlier this lesson um, in the reactions between acids and bases. And it's very similar when naming a salt in the reactions between metals and acids. So there's two parts to the salt name and the first part comes from the metal. So for example, it could be magnesium or it could be iron, but it's whatever metal was used. The second part comes from the acid, just the same as when we're naming a salt made from an acid and a base. So hydrochloric acid makes a chloride, sulfuric acid makes a sulfate, and nitric acid makes a nitrate. So I'd like you to pause the video now and have a go at these equations. Okay, so sulfuric acid plus sodium produces sodium sulfate plus hydrogen. Hydrogen hydrochloric acid plus copper produces copper chloride plus hydrogen. And nitric acid plus zinc produces zinc nitrate plus hydrogen. Don't forget, after going to all the, through all the work of naming your salt, do not forget to put plus hydrogen if, it, if it's a reaction between a metal and an acid, or plus water if it's a reaction between an acid and a base. So if you'd like to pause the video now and work backwards to, to identify the reactants in these reactions. OK, so for the first one, sulfuric acid plus nickel will give nickel sulfate plus hydrogen. Now, hydrochloric acid plus aluminium will give aluminium chloride plus hydrogen. And nitric acid plus calcium will give calcium nitrate plus hydrogen. So we could make a salt, and I would demonstrate this in, if we were at school in the chemistry lab, we can make a salt by adding an, a metal to an acid. So for example here, we use the metal magnesium. So magnesium we tend to use in the form of magnesium ribbon, so it'd be a, a grey coloured shiny strip of magnesium ribbon, adding it to our colourless hydrochloric acid. And what we would see is we would see bubbles because hydrogen gas is produced. And if we have a gas produced in a, a solution, it bubbles out. So, so, uh, so we can tell a gas is being produced there. I'd like you to have a think about how we could make sure that all the acid has reacted and how could we tell when the reaction is finished. So you want to pause the video now? OK, so we can tell that all the acid is reacted. So to make sure that all the acid is reacted, we can use indicator to check the pH. If all the acid is reacted, then the solution of the salt should be neutral and we should have a pH 7. Or we can keep adding the magnesium until no more reacts. How could we tell when the reaction is finished? When there's no more bubbles of hydrogen produced. So looking at the same demonstration, I'd like you to have a think about how you could collect a pure dry sample of magnesium chloride and think back to the method that we looked at when reacting sulfuric acid with copper oxide. So first you would add your magnesium to your hydrochloric acid and make sure that all your acid has reacted, which we discussed on the last slide. So when the reaction has finished, what we are left with is a solution of our salt, magnesium chloride. The hydrogen was a gas, so it escaped. Now remember, this is an aqueous solution, so it contains water, and we want a pure dry sample of this salt. So you can heat it to evaporate off some of the water. One way to do this is using a water bath, and this is a, a much gentler way of heating. When you are heating salts in an evaporating basin, if you heat them directly, they can very often start to spit towards the end of heating them, and it's just much more gentle if we do it in an evaporating basin. So here, there is some boiling water in a beaker, 
and that's being placed over a Bunsen burner so it's being being kept boiling and the evaporating basin containing the magnesium chloride solution is placed on top of the beaker so that's a water bath you heat it until the point of crystallization and you know you're at the point of crystallization because that's when crystals start to appear around the evaporating dish and just as uh, an interesting note, if the slower the water evaporates from the solution, the bigger the crystals you get that form. If it evaporates very slowly, so if I just left it on the side and did no heating, it's evaporating much more slowly and the crystals, um, the crystals will be much larger. If I were to evaporate all the water off with heating and take it till it was pretty much fully crystallised with heating, then the crystals would be much smaller. So finally, when we're looking at metals reacting with acids, I'd like to explain why we should not try to make a salt using the following reactions. So making copper chloride from copper and hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride from sodium and hydrochloric acid. I put a reactivity series there to help you. So if you'd like to pause the video now. OK, so why don't we make copper chloride from copper and hydrochloric acid? It's because copper is below hydrogen in the reactivity series. Let's grab my pen. Copper is below hydrogen, um, so it's not reactive enough. No reaction will occur. It cannot displace the hydrogen from the acid. And why don't we make sodium chloride from sodium and hydrochloric acid? It's because sodium is too reactive and will react explosively when added to the acid, so it's not safe to do. So we're going to look at a final method of making salts. And before we do that, I just wanted to introduce this word to you, carbonate. A carbonate is a compound containing carbon and oxygen. And it's from a French word meaning to impregnate with carbonic acid gas. That's what you get when carbon dioxide dissolves in water. So metal carbonates contain the iron CO3 2 minus, and that's an iron that you will find it very, very useful to memorise. It's the carbonate iron CO3 2 minus, and I've given you a picture there of copper carbonate, and the chemical formula for copper carbonate will be CuCO3. And next lesson, we're going to have a closer look at how to construct those chemical formulas. So our third method is to react an acid with a carbonate, which will give us salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. This is another general equation that you need to know. So there's three now. An example could be hydrochloric acid plus calcium carbonate produces calcium chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide. And there is a symbol equation for that reaction. Just to show you there, the hydrochloric acid is a colourless solution. By adding it to cal calcium carbonate, which is a white powder, producing the salt calcium chloride, which is another white powder, then we have water and carbon dioxide. Naming the salt is done in a very similar fashion to when we're reacting an acid with a metal or an acid with a base. We take the name of the metal from the carbonate name, so it's calcium. And then we look at the acid, which in this case is hydrochloric acid, to get the salt ending, and it's a chloride. So it's calcium chloride. So in this reaction, how could we prove that carbon dioxide is produced? Let's see what you can remember from um, from a topic that we've learned before. So I know that carbon dioxide is produced, it's a gas, but how could we prove that? If we bubble the gas through lime water, the lime water will turn cloudy. So it goes from colourless to cloudy if the gas is carbon dioxide. I'd like you to pause the video now and have a go at these questions. So most carbonates are insoluble in water. That means they don't dissolve. You are given magnesium carbonate, copper carbonate, hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid. And you first of all have to identify four salts that can be made using these acids and carbonates and write word equations for those. So if you'd like to pause the video now. 
Okay, so first of all, if I look at magnesium carbonate and hydrochloric acid, and I react those together, I have my acid plus my carbonate, and that produces a salt, which is magnesium chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide. Never forget to write plus water plus carbon dioxide in the reaction of an acid and a carbonate. Very often people go to all the trouble of naming their salt and they forget those products that are always produced, the water and carbon dioxide. So that is the word equation and salt for one of the four salts that can be formed. I could have used copper carbonate instead of magnesium carbonate. So I could I put copper and then it, the products would be copper chloride plus water plus carbon dioxide. My third salt would be um, magnesium sulfate. So if I used magnesium carbonate plus sulfuric acid, I would get magnesium sulfate plus water plus carbon dioxide. And my fourth salt would be copper sulfate, and that is copper carbonate plus sulfuric acid gives copper sulfate plus water plus carbon dioxide. And then it says describe two ways in which you could decide whether an acid has been completely neutralised by an insoluble carbonate. Well, you could use universal indicator. If our acid has been neutralised, our indicator should change colour to indicate that the solution is pH 7, it is neutral. Or you could keep adding the carbonate until no more, no more reacted. And you would see that because the, the carbonate would stop disappearing or it would stop, you know, it appears that it's disappearing in our acid. So if you add an excess, when the reaction stopped, you'll start getting the, the insoluble carbonate forming in your acid. And describe a method for obtaining pure dry pure dry sample of crystals of one of your salts. Well, this um, is comparable to the method that we've previously looked at. So if I show you this slide again, if I go for copper carbonate um, and sulfuric acid, because copper sulfate was one of the salts, if you gently heat the sulfuric acid and then add the copper carbonate, uh, add a spatula and, and swirl it and a spatula and swirl it until the copper carbonate um, starts to stop disappearing and starts to um, you'll be able to start to see it as a solid in your solution. You then filter the solution, which will be your products, copper sulfate, water and the carbon dioxide will have escaped, but also the excess copper carbonate. The excess copper carbonate will collect in the filter paper and you'll just have a solution of copper sulfate and water. And if you pour that into an evaporating basin, and heat it gently until it starts to crystallise. You start getting crystals appearing around the edge of the solution and then you can let it cool down and put it on the side for a couple of days, let the rest of the water evaporate. And just to make sure you can then use a spatula to put your crystals on some filter paper to absorb any small amounts of water that may be left.